Okay, so day two, um, I'm not sure how far your class may have been able to get, so I'm gonna back up to the beginning of this Christianity lecture, um, which is, again, the purpose is to help us learn about the Puritans. Um, all right, so, as I said, you've got the Christian church, you know, in whatever, you know, whatever it was called at the time and all that, um, and then we separate that down into Catholic, Protestant, and other, and so yesterday we discussed the origins of the term Protestant and where that comes from. We talked about Martin Luther and him nailing his 95 theses or arguments to the church in Wittenberg and being excommunicated for this. And we did not get into specifically what his arguments were, but we were, uh, when we left off, um, we were discussing three of his kind of like key beliefs where he felt like they're kind of fundamental to the Lutheran uh, faith, and that's going to be important for us as we discuss Calvinism. So um, we have uh, the first being that there should be a bigger focus on the loving nature of God, right? That God is all loving. He loves you. He loves everyone, um, no matter what you've done, et cetera, et cetera, right? That that should be a very central part of the faith. Um, number two was the issue of salvation. We were talking about how the Catholic Church at that time believed, I'm not, and I don't know now, but, or, well, I mean, I do, but I'm not going to speak to now. Uh, but the, the, the Catholic Church believed that salvation could only be accomplished through a combination of faith and works, including the seven sacraments. Uh, Luther argued um, the idea of faith, uh, justification by faith alone is the, the term that is used by theologians, justification by faith alone that um, essentially um, you are saved simply by having faith in Christ. And all the good works that you may do, including the seven sacraments, um, which he didn't necessarily follow all seven, but including the sacraments, um, such as baptism, those are all good things to do, things you ought to do. And in fact, Luther argued that if your faith was actually true, you would be drawn to do those things. But he argued that salvation, whether you go to heaven or hell, was based purely on your faith and not something that you could do yourself. Um, and then uh, finally, Luther believed in a uh, theological precept called sola scriptori, which means through scripture, I mean scripture alone. Um, he believed there was a lot of stuff in the Catholic faith that came uh, from other things came from various creeds and uh, papal dictates and so on that were not necessarily in the Bible, right? Many of these things might be justified by the Bible. There were things the Catholic Church um, are preached that had been said by someone else, but you could make the argument that like, yes, but if you look, the Bible does support that. But he's like, no, 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 if it's not in the Bible, that's it, it's not allowed. Okay, so this brings us to John Calvin. Um, John Calvin looked at Luther's whole deal and he was a big fan uh, but Calvin had some issues um, first of all it's important to understand Luther looked at the Catholic Church as fixable he did not want to break off and start a Lutheran church as his followers did after his death Calvin did not Calvin was extremely opposed to Catholicism he did not care for he believed Cap the Catholic faith was corrupt and unfixable so that is important to understand uh, Calvin agreed with Luther on most issues, um, most of the 95 theses, but he disagreed with some certain issues, specifically some of the ones we just talked about. So first of all, on the issue of focusing on the loving nature of God, Calvin argued that God's nature was not primarily loving, that it was primarily vengeful and angry. He, vi he viewed that the world was in sin and God was very angry about this and he would strike down with vengeance the human race uh, upon the human race for its sinfulness. So he was not a big fan of the idea of looking at God as loving. He felt like no God should be looked at more as an angry, vengeful God. Um, second, oh yeah, I was just adjusting my my camera a little bit there. So get a little little less of that blue. I'm getting this uh, blue wash from the windows behind me. I need to my office computer needs to be upgraded so I can cut video. Okay, so anyway, so as I was saying, Calvin um, focused on that. Uh, on the more vengeful side of God, rather than a vengeful, angry God, less than a loving side of that. Um, two, he did not believe in the concept of faith 
by uh, our justification by faith. Um, Calvin argued in a concept known as predestination, which is the theological idea that God is so all-knowing and so all-controlling that um, human beings have absolutely no role in their salvation. Um, that there, it's not just it's not just that good works don't save you. Um, even faith doesn't save you. Uh, what decides whether you're going to heaven or hell was God in the first place. God decides before you're ever born whether you are going to go to heaven or hell, and nothing you do in life will affect that. Um, instead, the things you do in life reflect that, right? So um, if you are a person who is very, very faithful and constantly doing good things and behaving in a very good manner, that is a reflection of your salvation, not a cause for your salvation, if that makes any sense. Uh, so this concept of predestination essentially uh, divided the world into two categories, the elect, those who are saved and going to heaven, and the damned, everyone else, who are going to go to hell. Um, and the damned included, um, for Calvin, pretty much everyone who wasn't a member of his church. So very exclusive group, the elect, for Calvin. Um, the, uh, so that is it. And then the third thing is, um, while the Calvinists did not believe that you could save yourself through good works, as I mentioned, they believed that good behavior and good works and good faith were a reflection of your salvation. Um, so you can't know for sure if you're one of the elect, but if you are being very, very good, that's a sign you're one of the elect, right? And so um, this leads to the Calvinists having very strict guidelines for moral behavior, um, which included things like no um, outward displays of affection, like holding hands, kissing, things like that, um, uh, even among married couples uh, outside of the, the, the bedroom. Um, no dancing, uh, no use of musical instruments, if you musical instruments is sinful, um, no gambling, drinking, smoking of tobacco, uh, no um, participation in animal sports, um, which in Europe and in the colonies, very, very popular were um, some horrifically, just horrifically evil animal sports were very, very common. Um, bear baiting, where you take a bear and you cut off one of its paws and then sick a pack of dogs on it and you bet on how many dogs will die before the bear dies or will the bear win, you know, kill all the dogs. Um, dog, you're, you're running the mill dog fighting, uh, bull baiting, which was like bear baiting, but instead it's a bull and you like stab it a couple of times. So it's starting to bleed to death and then sick the dogs on it. So really horrific stuff. Uh, they said no animal fights, no animal sports at all. That includes horse racing as well though, and things like that. Uh, and uh, probably other stuff I'm forgetting. But anyway, very strict moral code of behavior. So that's the Calvinists. They're over in Europe. Now, meanwhile, as we discussed earlier last week on Friday, we discussed Henry VIII um, uh, in the mid-16th century breaking uh, England off of the Catholic Church and forming the Anglican Church, a.k.a. the Church of England. Uh, now, the Anglican Church was, at that point in history, essentially exactly the same as the Catholic Church in terms of beliefs and practices, everything, except no pope. Instead of the pope, the head of the church is the king or queen of England, usually the king. Um, um, and then uh, they allowed divorce. Um, I, I think that's the only real differences, though later under King James in the, 17th, in the early 17th century, they would adopt an English translation of the Bible rather than a Latin, the Latin uh, Bible that was used by the Catholic Church. Um, and I should mention, by the way, the Lutherans translated the Catholic Bible into uh, the Latin Bible into German. Um, the Calvinist tra uh, translated it into into the the uh, well, gosh, what are they? Switzerland, whatever they speak in Sw it's Swiss. Yeah, Swiss. <laughs> First, I was like, what are these people saying? Swiss. Um, they, they all started translating the Bible out of Latin. Um, and very soon, uh, a Latin Bible became synonymous with the Catholicism. So any Protestant denomination is going to use a different translation. And the King James translation will obviously become very big in the English-speaking world. Uh, but anyway, uh, other than that, the Anglican Church is basically the Catholic Church, just with some slight differences back then. 
but they consider themselves to be part of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, today, the Anglican Church considers itself to be a Protestant denomination, but it's important to note they weren't really part of the Protestant Reformation. They were their own thing that we call the English Reformation, but they are usually considered Protestant, so I drew a line there. All right, so we got the Anglican Church in England. It's officially the only legal church in England. Now, the Anglican, back then, now, the Anglican Church is what's called a hierarchical church, like the Catholic Church, meaning you've got someone at the top, the King of England, right? And then you've got archbishops, and then you've got bishops, and so on, right? And when your, you know, parish or whatever, right, your, your county, whatever it's called in England, your shire, whatever, uh, needs a priest, the bishop in your area assigns you a priest. And that priest might be from your community, but he might not be, right? Um, and that's how that works. And that's still how that works, right? The, the Catholic Church, you know, in Conroe, the, the priest and, and uh, the priest at that church, um, I, I, you know, they are appointed by the bishop of the archdiocese that Conroe is part of. Um, and, or the diocese, or I, I'm not, again, I'm not super familiar with the structure. Um, and the people of, the, of Sacred Heart, right, um, I, I'm sure that there's a board that has some, you know, control over who, you know, which priests are picked to some extent, but ultimately it's up to the bishop to, you know, to appoint them. That's how a hierarchical church, like the Catholic Church or uh, the Methodist Church, for instance, or the Episcopal Church, that's how they work. Um, so anyway, that is important for us as we talk about the Puritan faith. So Puritans are, to put it simply, Anglican Calvinists, or Calvinist Anglicans actually would be a better way of putting it, Calvinist Anglicans. They are members of the Anglican Church who like Calvinism, who want to adopt Calvinist beliefs into the Anglican faith. So Puritans, which is not what they call themselves, they did not call themselves Puritans. Uh, that was a term that was made up to make fun of them. But uh, P Puritans Essentially, they, call, they felt that they, they believed we're Anglicans. We're just regular Anglicans. We just believe in some Calvinist stuff. What Calvinist stuff do they believe in? Um, well, here, that's better. Uh, Calvinist, they believe in the stuff we talked about. You know, angry, vengeful God, um, predestination, you know, and uh, very, very pure behavior, right? Thus the term Puritan, right? So all those same like behavioral guidelines that I've talked about the Calvinists, the Puritans believe in those also. Um, and where, where we get the distinction is there are essentially two types of Puritan. Um, about 99% of Puritans were called Congregationalists. And that's actually what they call themselves. They call themselves Congregationalist Anglicans. Um, and essentially their whole deal was we still want to be Anglicans. We don't want to, you know, get rid of the Anglican faith or anything like that, but we want to make the Anglican faith better or pure, purify it, right? And we want to do that by being able to form our own community churches or congregations. We want to be able to, you know, send our own young men off to seminary, off to Anglican seminaries like Oxford or Cambridge and have, you know, and, and have them be our local priest and lead our congregations. We don't want the bishop to just give us some random priest that may or may not, most likely not, believe in Calvinism. So that's the whole Congregationalist thing. So the Congregationalists are not oppressed. They are not discriminated against, they're not treated badly, and they will become um, very, very, very powerful in England. They will become a very powerful political force. Um, they're never, they're never mistreated. The worst thing that ever happens to them is that the Anglican church sometimes doesn't let them choose their priest. And when they try to force their neighbors to obey their rules, the English government sometimes comes in and says, no, you can't force your neighbors. You can't like fine your neighbors for playing musical instruments. That's crazy. You can't do that. That's the extent of any discrimination or um, persecution of congregations. Now, the other 1% of Puritans, however, were called separatist. And again, not what they call themselves. Separatist was a term people used to criticize them. 
they call themselves pilgrims. So you've heard of the pilgrims and you probably didn't, you've heard of Puritans, you've heard of pilgrims, and you probably didn't realize they're the same thing, but they are. The only difference between Congregationalist Puritans and Separatist Puritans or pilgrims is Congregationalists believed we can fix the Anglican church from within. Separatists believed the, the Anglican church is beyond saving. We have to, to leave and start our own church. That was the difference. Um, the separatists or pilgrims essentially believe, so all the Puritans believe the Anglican church is still too Catholic. It's still got all this stuff about, there's a lot of Catholic stuff that the Puritans don't like that they still see in the Anglican church and they want to fix it. The Congregationalists want to fix it by fixing it, like staying in it and kind of influencing it by having their own congregations and growing their own version of the Anglican faith. Separatists or pilgrims wanted to break away and start their own religion. Now they are discriminated against and persecuted because that's not legal. You can't go off and start your own church in England. It was illegal. Um, so they were sometimes jailed. They weren't ever like, you know, hunted down and killed or anything like that. Um, but they were, they were sometimes jailed or fined, um, or assaulted, uh, by neighbors and so on for trying to go off and start their own churches. And so, um, the pilgrims, eventually a bunch of them, several hundred of them left England and they did not go to America. They went to the Netherlands. They went to the Netherlands and they settled um, in and around Amsterdam in the Netherlands because Netherlands was at that point in time the only country on the planet with freedom of religion. And so they could start their own churches and practice freely. However, this turned out to not be great either because, again, they they wanted to be able to live in a community where everyone is like them, right? But they're living, you know, down the street from Jews and who go to synagogue on Saturday instead of Sunday, right? Um, and who have a whole other system of beliefs in them in some ways. And Catholics and Muslims and, you know, uh, Lutherans and so on, right? Dutch Reformed Church, which was its own thing. Um, and they, they don't like that, right? They're, their kids are, you know, mixing with, you know, other kids and of other faiths and the pilgrims didn't want that. So they're not being persecuted anymore, not in the Netherlands. They were being persecuted in England to some extent, but they moved to the Netherlands. They're not being persecuted there, uh, but they still don't like it. And so about 150 of them leave the Netherlands and go to America and start the Plymouth colony. And that's going to be our second colony that we talked about. And so here we have a map here. So you can see our dates. So um, Virginia is 1607. Then uh, and Maryland is 1623. Uh, um, and Massachusetts is, as I say, 1628 for Massachusetts. Or am I getting Massachusetts and Maryland mixed up? Um, 1629 for Massachusetts. Yeah. So, but Plymouth is 1620. Now, Plymouth is an interesting colony to talk about. Um, because uh, it is very different from the colonies that we've discussed. It is very different from most of the other colonies we will discuss. Uh, Plymouth is not a joint stock company. It's not a proprietary colony. It's not a royal colony. It is a illegal church a col a, a colony. And what I mean by illegal is what I said. Uh, they did not have legal permission from the King of England to start this colony. Um, the, they did, the King of England didn't even know they existed at first. They chartered a ship, they rented a ship called the Mayflower, and they sailed to the New World. They actually intended to land in Virginia, which would have probably worked out very badly for them. They probably would have just been arrested and sent back to England. But they got blown off course, and they ended up in where, where you see there on the map, on this... Uh, this uh, peninsula sticking out into the Massachusetts Bay um, where they founded the fir their first settlement called Plymouth right there. Now, if you go to visit Plymouth today and you can see Plymouth Rock and all that, um, I think, do I have a picture of Plymouth Rock? I thought I did. No, I don't. Uh, 
Um, if you go to Plymouth Bay, if you go to Plymouth today, which is in Massachusetts, um, we, we'll get to that in chapter three. But um, if you go to Plymouth and you go to Plymouth Rock, they've got a rock there with like a fence around it. So you can't touch it. Um, that is not Plymouth Rock. Uh, there is no such thing as Plymouth Rock. That was some, uh, something that was made up many years later. But also that rock is not even at the location where they actually landed. It's just not. But anyway, um, it's a tourist thing. Until we get to Salem, same thing. Uh, anyway, yeah, so they found the Plymouth Colony, um, and uh, there's a lot of stuff to talk about with Plymouth because it is different, as I said. Uh, first of all, climate-wise, extremely mild, easy summers, right? It's not too hot, not too cold in the summer. It's just right in the summer. It's great. You could even grow crops. You're not gonna be growing tobacco or anything like that, but you can grow corn and, and wheat and very, you know, beans and turnips and so on. Food, you can grow lots of food uh, in, the, in the summer. In the winter, it is like nightmarishly horrible. The winter is incredibly cold and wet. Tons of snow because you're sticking out into the ocean, right? So it's just gonna be like so much snow, incredibly wet and cold, really bad uh, conditions in the winters. Um, in terms of the people that move there, it's not just pilgrims um, because uh, they actually end up bringing, it's like, I think the numbers is something like 150 pilgrims and like 70 other random people from various countries, actually. Uh, and so they're not going to be quite as uh, strict on religious law as Massachusetts will be, as we'll get, at least not at first. Um, economically speaking, it is small family farms growing crops for their survival and to sell at, you know, on the weekend kind of thing, but or sell, sell at the market. But it's not going to be these like massive family farms. I mean, these massive farms, uh, they're not going to have a lot of indentured servants or slaves because they won't have a lot of need for those things. Not because they are religiously opposed to either, because they're not necessarily, though some of them are, um, but because there's no purpose. There's no reason to bring in hundreds of indigenous servants or hundreds of slaves because you're not going to make that kind of money farming there, right? So instead it's going to be family farms and they might, a wealthy pilgrim might bring in two or three indigenous servants or a slave, right? But it's not going to be like that. Um, the ground is also very rocky. And so again, you could grow, you know, corn and stuff, but you're not going to have just like massive fields of cash crops like you will in the Southern colonies. Um, government wise, when they first moved there, they established a set of, it's not really a constitution, but kind of a set of guidelines called the Mayflower Compact. And they, they govern based on that. And it includes a, a representative council of landowning men elected by landowning men. So landowning men in the colony can vote for their fellow landowning men for a representative council that will make all the rules and all that kind of stuff. Um, and they also, uh, early on, they practice um, what I like to jokingly call little c communism, um, but it's more commonly referred to as communal socialism or, or commutary, commutary socialism is another term for it, yeah, communal. Uh, meaning um, when they first move there, they have uh, kind of storehouses for storing crops, clothes, tools, commodities like candles, soap, etc., and everyone just contributes to the storehouses and then takes from them as needed. And so this is a, a form of socialism uh, where, uh, where it's just a small community sharing everything. This only lasts for about seven years. They end up dropping it uh, due to um, various issues, but mostly just people not getting along over it. And they end up just going into just a, you know, standard small community capitalism. Everybody's got their own farm, does their own thing, sells stuff to each other, right? That kind of thing. Um, in terms of standard of living, it's gonna be far higher than the South with a very high, relatively high um, uh, birth rate. This is something we really didn't talk about with Virginia, but you will read about, but Virginia had a very, what we call uneven sex ratio, way more men than women at first. Plymouth Colony is going to be almost 50-50, about 50-50 male-female, maybe 51-49. Uh, 
Uh, so um, there are going to be families, and there will be families that have lots of kids. Um, and everything I'm saying here, by the way, for the most part, applies to all Puritan. It applies to Massachusetts as well, and Connecticut, and Rhode Island, and New Hampshire, in terms of climate and economy and uh, standard of living and all that stuff. And yeah, so we have lots of kids uh, with creepy adult faces. Um, but yeah, we have lots of kids, big families, and I think I'm going in the wrong direction. I am. Um, and yeah, they're going to have a low death rate, low infant mortality rate, longer life expectancy, better standard of living, less disease, just better overall. It's going to be way better. Winters are going to be really hard, uh, but otherwise. Um, now, one thing that really they lucked out on, or as they saw it, were blessed on, was when they landed at Plymouth, they discovered empty, hu empty houses, uh, fields full of corn already planted. This found essentially an empty village waiting for them when they first landed. And very shortly after they landed, a friendly Native American named Squanto came into the village and introduced himself, speaking perfect English. And so they really did believe God had like blessed them um, and kind of ordained this is where we're supposed to be landing, right? Because they're aiming for Virginia and a storm blows them off course and they end up in an empty village full of food and a friendly Native American who speaks their language. Like you can see why they felt like God had kind of ordained that they were supposed to be here, right? Um, and, you know, theologically speaking, whatever, right? But uh, if we want to talk about what happened, um, English traders had visited the Plymouth area um, about 15 years earlier. Um, they had, uh, you can see this map from 1606 by Fr the French uh, leader Samuel de Champlain. He had mapped out the uh, Plymouth and he had done what's called reckoning. That's what all those numbers are. They indicate the depth at different places to determine whether this would be a good harbor, which yes, anything over a five is very good. And so you see it's actually a very good natural harbor for bringing in big ships, but it's you know very densely populated as you see, lots of Native American settlements around it. Um, but anyway, English traders had come, they had traded with the local Indians, um, they had kidnapped Squanto and sold him into slavery. He had lived in England for a while, been taught English and given his freedom by a benevolent master and sent back to America. And when he got back to Plymouth, he discovered that his entire civilization, his village and most of the villages around it, everyone had died. And he traveled to a nearby village and he found that basically he was the last survivor of his people that uh, historians believe probably bubonic plague, the Black Death, has swept through and killed everyone. Um, and so uh, Squanto was adopted into that village. Then two years later, the pilgrims showed up. And so the pilgrims are going to, at least early on, have a very positive relationship with the local Indians, thanks to Squanto. That's not going to last forever, but this is where we get the Thanksgiving tradition and all that, though it was most likely in August and they most likely, no, not most likely, they definitely ate mostly fish and shellfish. Um, definitely no turkeys. There's no turkeys in the Plymouth area. But uh, anyway, it didn't become a holiday until the Civil War. Uh, but anyway, anyway, anyway. So as I was saying, that's, that's the Plymouth Colony. Um, and I think we've pretty much covered everything about Plymouth. So we've got about eight minutes left. So I want to, in those last kind of eight minutes, talk about the other Puritan colony Massachusetts Bay Colony. So Massachusetts Bay Colony um, is different from Plymouth, uh, is similar in that it is a Puritan colony. It differs in, the, in a lot of other ways. So um, it is, unlike the Plymouth Colony, it is not illegal. It is very much a legal colony. Um, these Puritans are the Congregationalist sort, and they're a, a group of wealthy Puritan investors get together and they get permission from the King of England to start a colony and so they form a joint stock company called the Massachusetts Bay Col uh, Company. Uh, so they are, um, they are both a church colony and a company colony. Um, their purpose, as stated by their first governor, John Winthrop, uh, was to create kind of a um, perfect society that would serve as an example to the Anglican church in England and kind of prove that the Anglican church should adopt Puritan beliefs and uh, practices. So he said, um, he, he used the phrase, he said, we shall be as a city on a hill. 
whose faith shines to guide the world, right? He's uh, paraphrasing uh, Jesus there. Um, but the idea of like uh, of making your faith as a city on a hill, right? So the idea being uh, that um, Massachusetts Bay, and to a more specific extent, its first settlement, Boston, um, would serve as an example of if you create an all Puritan society, how great things will be. And to his credit, it does work out extremely well. Massachusetts Bay is going to be very, very successful economically. Uh, their economy is going to include all that stuff we talk about with the pilgrims, the small scale farming, family farming, but they're also going to very quickly become a center of shipping and trade and fishing, right? And so they're going to have an economy based, um, they're eventually, Massachusetts, Massachusetts colony is going to be based, uh, their economy is going to be mostly based around shipping, around trade, because they've got lots of good natural harbors. Uh, you see here, Boston Harbor especially is an excellent harbor, really great. Um, it's going to be, um, as of the American Revolution, it's going to be the second biggest, um, uh, second busiest port in all of the New World after Philadelphia, um, which is way over here, off the map. But anyway, um, but yeah, Massachusetts Bay is going to be very, very, uh, very uh, popular. They're going to population is going to double every generation so they're just going to like every 20 years double in population because they have a really high life expectancy really high standard of living and a very high birth rate um, it is going to at first be all puritan but they will allow non-puritans to move there but those they will be ruled under puritan rule at first because in order to serve in the their um, colonial assembly uh, not just to serve, to vote, not only to hold office, but even to vote, you have to be a full member of the Puritan church. And to be a full member of the church uh, is actually difficult. They have lots of people that attend their church that aren't even considered full members. To become a full member uh, was kind of a complicated process. Um, and so it's a very elite group of wealthy men who can even vote in the first place. They have to be full members of the church, male, and landowners to be able to vote and to hold office. And so uh, for the first like 50 years, that colony will be ruled by a small elite of Puritan leaders. And so their laws will be based around Puritan law. So, you know, singing, I mean, uh, musical instruments will be illegal, right? Uh, public displays of affection will be illegal and punishable by, you know, physical punishment like public whipping or being put in the stocks and things like that of course with of course witchcraft um and things of that nature also illegal and prosecuted um they will be very harsh toward religious dissenters who don't want to follow the rules uh such as quakers who often um you know will preach on street corners uh they will be arrested and have like hot pokers poked through their tongues or have their tongues cut down the middle with scissors uh, to give them a forked tongue like a snake, things like that. So they're going to be uh, very, very harsh in that manner in terms of enforcing Puritanism. Um, and we're about to stop there. Uh, I think that actually might be a good place to stop. So we'll just go ahead. We, that's 34 minutes. We'll go ahead and stop there. All right. See you tomorrow.